Okay, folks, so this morning we are into our last uh, letter uh, in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 3. So let's read the words that are spoken to the church at Laodicea, and we're going to be reading from verse 14. Just a reminder that we have been looking at Revelation, that's singular, it's a revelation, it's the unveiling, the consummation of all things. It's the only book in the Bible that gives a clear exhortation to read it and thereby receive a special blessing. No other book uh, has the, the gall, as it were, to say, read me and you'll be blessed, which really begs the question as to why so many Christians don't read this book. In the 404 verses in the book of Revelation, uh, we have over 800 allusions to the Old Testament, and we know that John is, has this vision, he's on the island of Patmos, and he's instructed in chapter 1, verse 19, write there for what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later, metatauta the things that are to come. Uh, and the things that are, of course, refer to exactly what we've been looking at in the seven churches. The things that are to take place are unfolded in the remaining chapters of the book. We also said that each letter has a prophetic implication. There's a local context uh, and meaning for that particular church. And then there is an era in church history to which every church points. We saw that Ephesus was diligent about doctrine, uh, but lacking in devotion. They had lost their first love. We saw Smyrna, which means myrrh, which speaks of death. And we saw how it pointed to the persecution of the early church. Pergamus, what Satan could not accomplish from without, he does from within, by having the church marry the world, what we commonly refer to as syncretism, where the church becomes one with the world, we adopt the, the standards and the values of the world to try and carry favor, as it were, with the world. And this was what we saw at Pergamus, and then we saw the and that was also typified by the, the kind of amalgamation of state and church in, in terms of the Emperor Constantine and so on. And then we had the medieval church, which was, uh, had the prominent figure of Jezebel as described by Thyatira. And, of course, that spoke into the uh, papal church from 500 to about 1500 uh, A.D., and we saw some of the horrific things that took place through the church in that period. And then we came to Sardis, who thought that they were alive, but were in fact dead. And that spoke to the denominational church that rose up following the Reformation. And last week we looked at the church in Philadelphia, uh, and it was a missionary church, and it speaks of the missionary era of the church where some of the great uh, men and women of old, uh, the Livingstons and the Carries and so on, went out and spread the gospel right across the world. And so we come to this final church, the seventh church, and we also noted that two churches have no commendation and two churches have no condemnation. And here we have a church that has no commendation, the last church in Laodicea. And so let's read from verse 14, shall we? To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, these are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. 
that you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and solve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Those whom I love are rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person, and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. May God bless his word to us this morning. Amen. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Lord, as we come to the end of your letters to your church, we are so mindful as we have gone through these churches of of those areas where we have failed as your church here at Willows. We are mindful of our shortcomings, of how so much in these letters is spoken to us. And we pray, Lord God, that this letter may be no different, that we would be open and attentive to what you, by your Spirit, are wanting to say to your church today. And so we thank you for this letter. We pray that you would Open our hearts to receive whatever word you have for us today. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. So to the angel of the church at Laodicea, write. So let's find out a little more about this city called Laodicea. Laodicea was some 60 kilometers southeast of Philadelphia. It was also the junction of two roads that passed from Ephesus and Smyrna, and so it was a key city. And the history of the city goes back some 2,000 years, or before Christ, is when it really began. In about 900 BC, it was captured by the Phrygians and soon afterwards by the Lydians. And then in about 250 BC, it was taken over by Antiochus uh, the second, uh, the king of the Seleucid Empire, who named the city Laodicea in honor of his wife, Laodice. And so Laodicea was a city of merchant bankers and refiners. Cicero held court there and apparently did all his banking there. And we spoke the last two weeks about an earthquake in 17 AD, or there was another earthquake in 62 AD. And it's quite remarkable, this earthquake devastated the entire city, but the remarkable thing is that the citizens rallied together and they built that entire city, rebuilt it at their own cost. Every other city that had been destroyed through an earthquake especially in 17 AD, uh, the emperor of Rome, Tiberius at the time, came to their rescue. And almost in, uh, as a payback for the rescue of the city, he was venerated. He had a huge statue uh, put up so that the people would literally worship him. But not so with this city. This city had no assistance from 
the Roman emperor at all. The people came at their own cost and rebuilt it. And so this was a really wealthy city. It was a city that was driven by pride uh, and self-sufficiency, self-interest. Almost this was like the, the Santon of the area. One of the larger industries was textiles, and they were particularly renowned for a breed of sheep that had wool that was particularly soft, and it was also black. These were black sheep. You don't often get black sheep. And so they produced clothing uh, with black wool, the kind of clothes that you would wear and people would ask, wow, did you get that from Laodicea? A bit like those who wear cashmere. And so Laodicea was also famous for their medical school, especially the Department of Ophthalmology. They produced an, an ophthalmic ointment or salve that healed various eye disorders. Now, the city formed part of a three-city triangle, uh, Colossae, Laodicea, and Hierapolis, and all were within about 10 kilometers of each other. Hierapolis was known for its hot springs. Uh, it was... Uh, an aqueduct was built uh, from Hierapolis to Laodicea, underground aqueduct that was served to pump water from the hot springs to Laodicea. But due to the distance and because of it went through an underground aqueduct, it became really dirty. And by the time it reached Laodicea, it was just tepid. It was lukewarm. And it couldn't really be used for anything. In fact, unsuspecting visitors to the city who drank from it would immediately get sick. And so the three elements that were part of the commercial uh, operation of this city, the, the, the financial establishment, the wool and the eye ointment, uh, together with this water supply, all of which become part of this letter that Jesus brings to the church. And you, you have this picture that is formed based on these elements, uh, historical elements of the city. Some suggest that the church was founded by Epaphrodus, um, so, or Epaphras, as other translations say, and he was a character that you'll read about in the letter to Colossae. Uh, and, you know, there's some speculation on that, but it certainly is feasible in view of his missionary heart. Uh, Paul also addressed a, a letter to Laodicea, a letter that has not been preserved. We don't have a copy of it in Scripture. And in all likelihood, it was a circular letter. In other words, Paul wrote a letter, and because of the close proximity of these cities, he sent the letter from church to church in the different cities. Paul wrote his first letter to Timothy from Laodicea. And so this city was renowned in that part of the world. And Paul had a lot of dealings uh, with it. In Paphras as well, had a lot of dealings with this church. And so there we have some historical background, the situation, the salutation uh, to the angel of this church, right. Now we come to the title, and you will recall what it said in the title as Jesus spoke. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. And the New King James Version says the beginning of the creation of God. 
So what do we learn from this title? Well, remember the title that Christ uses of himself is typically taken from chapter 1 that we looked at in the introduction. And here it is no different. These are the words of the Amen. The Amen is a Hebrew word used to affirm the truthfulness of a statement. And so Amen means what has been said is the truth. It seals its authenticity. Jesus is the fixed, certain, faithful, faithful, unchangeable, amen. Amen? Amen. Amen. So be it. Amen means so be it. Amen. It is authentic. It seals its authenticity. Because he is the true, he is true all the time in every possible way. All that he says is true, and all that he promises is true. And that is why Paul could say in 2 Corinthians 1.20, we mentioned this last week, for all the promises of God in him, in other words, in Christ, are yes and amen, because they are authentic, they are true. Secondly, he is faithful and true witness. He's the faithful and true witness. Not only does Christ validate what God has said and what God has promised, when he speaks, that he is the faithful and true witness. He is completely trustworthy, completely reliable. He is, after all, the way, the truth, and the life. He is the perfect witness to everything we know about God, his character, his purpose, his plans, and his promises. So he's the amen, he's the faithful and true witness, and thirdly, he is the beginning of the creation of God. Now, remember we said there was possibly a circular letter. The church written to Colossae was in all likelihood distributed to Laodicea as well. And this is what Paul wrote. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him, that's Christ, and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Now, why was it so important for Paul to stress the deity of Christ as the creator in this letter? Well, last week, you recall, we said that one of the common elements or threads of all cults in the world, and there are many, and they differ in many ways, but the one common denominator is their denial of Christ's deity. And if you study Colossians, you will find that Paul wrote it to answer those who were denying the deity of Christ. In other words, there were those who were teaching that Christ was a created being, some kind of angelic being. And this heresy really filtered down to this church in Laodicea, which is why Paul says in Colossians 4.16, after this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. They didn't believe that Christ was the Alpha and the Omega, the creator of all things. They saw Jesus as a created being and not as God himself. And so here we have these three elements of the title that are very important because remember we said that the title that Christ uses is always pertinent to the church to which he writes. And these are some of the issues 
that we find in this church, which is why he uses these three titles. Then, as we mentioned, under the commendation, well, there is no commendation. What a sad indictment, again, that there is no commendation of this church. But there is a condemnation. And so we come to the condemnation and listen to these words carefully. I know your works. God knows all things. We can't try and hide anything from God. He knows exactly what we're doing and why we're doing it. He knows our motives and what drives us, whether it's out of selfish motives or pure motives. God knows all things. And he comes and he says, I know your works. That's good news. God knows what we're doing. But it can also be bad news. That you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, this is the King James Version I'm reading here. Because you say I am rich, I have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. There are three parts to that word of condemnation or complaint. You are, you say, and then you are. First of all, you are, verse 15. This is probably the strongest rebuke that Jesus could give any church. He says, you are lukewarm. In other words, you are like that dirty, tepid water in the aqueduct. And in other words, you make me sick. In contrast to the hot springs of Herapolis and the cold waters that came from Colossae, Laodicea had this dirty, foul, lukewarm water that flowed for miles through this filthy aqueduct. It wasn't hot enough to heal. It wasn't cold enough or clean enough to drink. It was foul and made people nauseous. And that's what our Lord is saying about this church. You make me nauseous. He sees the sham and the hypocrisy behind their claim to be believers. You are. But then... He points to their hypocrisy. You say, verse 17, you are deceived, in other words, because you say, but you don't know your true condition. The church's opinion of its own well-being is based on the deception that material wealth means spiritual wealth. They had developed a spiritual pride that went along with their material pride. They said, we are rich. We have become wealthy. We have need of nothing. And that is the most dangerous place to be in. It would be better for you to be an atheist, to be completely ignorant of the gospel, than living under this delusion that you are in fact well when you are so sick and so deceived. You are, you say, and then Jesus gives his verdict and says, you are again. In reality, they are not saved. 
You do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. They are actually unbelievers who assume that they are believers purely because they are part of this church. They live day to day with a sickening condition of thinking that they are spiritually rich when they are bankrupt thinking that they are beautiful when they are, in fact, wretched, believing that they are to be envied when, in fact, they are to be pitied, and believing that they see everything clearly when, in actual fact, they are blinded by their own deception. They feel that they are clothed in spiritual finery when in actual facts, in God's eyes, they are naked. This rebuke, and I'm sure many of us watch or have watched some of these television programs, Christian TV it's called, that speaks directly to so many prosperity churches today, you know, the name it, claim it preachers, the blab it, grab it guys. Didn't you know that God wants you to be wealthy? That God wants you to be prosperous? It's God's will for you to be prosperous. Well, that was certainly news to Paul and certainly news to Jesus. He did not have a place to call his own. They come with these these grandiose expressions, you don't, God never intended you to be sick. And if you are sick, it's, it's really not God's will. It's because there's sin in your life or it's because you don't have enough faith and so on. And so today... There are many churches, not just these prosperity churches, there are many other churches, and we need to examine ourselves in the same light, where we think we are prosperous spiritually, but we are, in fact, not. We think we are clothed spiritually, and yet we are naked. And we have to ask ourselves whether God's verdict of us would be that we are wretched, that we are pitiful, that we are poor, blind, and naked. All of those adjectives speak to the very things that they were boasting about. Their banking sector, their wealth, their clothing with this beautiful, soft, black wool, their eye soul for their for these eye disorders, and Jesus uses those very things that they were boasting about to show them their hypocrisy. So that is his condemnation. Then he brings his counsel. Again, the counsel speaks directly into those three things. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, that's really where you're going to be rich. When you buy from Jesus gold refined in the fire and white garments that you may be clothed, not the black garments that you derive from the black sheep that you have, white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. I want you to notice in one of the earlier verses that Jesus doesn't say, I will spit you out, but he actually says, I'm about to spit you out. The blow has not yet fallen. The light has not been, yet been extinguished. There is still hope. I'm about to spew you out. 
there's still opportunity for them to heed his counsel to repent and turn back to him. So what is this counsel? Well, here God's grace is offered to hypocrites. They are to buy his gold that they might become rich. And this refers to all the spiritual blessings, all the spiritual wealth that is pure and priceless. Secondly, they are to buy white garments from him. And we know whenever it speaks of white garments in Scripture, it's speaking of the righteousness of Christ. And so he exhorts them to buy these white garments, the righteousness that, righteousness that we receive from Christ. And then they are to buy his eye salve or ointment to heal their blindness. Because even though they think they see, they are in fact blind. Jesus said, what, is it a prophet? what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but forfeits his soul? Here was a church that seemingly had gained the whole world and yet had forfeited their soul. And so Jesus says, buy this gold that you might be truly rich, Buy these white garments that you might be truly righteous, not with your own righteousness, but with the righteousness, righteousness that comes from Christ. And buy I solve so that I might take away your spiritual blindness. You still with me? Friends, salvation is that gold which makes us spiritually rich in faith. It is that white robe that covers our sinful nakedness with the righteousness of God through Christ. It is the eye salve which gives us the knowledge of God, takes the scales of our eyes and allows us to see God for who He really is, illuminating grace and an understanding of God's truth. This is the same call to salvation that the prophet Isaiah brought in Isaiah 55, verse 1, Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. That is God's invitation to us today. He has done it all. He's paid the price. We cannot come with our own riches and think that we can somehow stand on those riches to come to God. They won't get us further than the grave. And then Jesus closes this counsel with the words, as many as I love I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Now when I see that, that, those words... As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. I want to just read a passage from Hebrews 12, and I'm sure you're familiar with it, and I want to read these six or seven verses because they are so, so relevant to what Jesus is saying here. So this is what the writer to the church, probably in Jerusalem, in other words, the letter to the Hebrews writes, And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Now, this is the exact word Jesus is bringing to Laodicea. Because... The Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? And if you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate. You are not true sons and daughters at all. 
Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while, as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in His holiness. That's why God disciplines us. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, he has the fruit. It produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who've been trained by it. Amazing passage of Scripture, that. And Jesus takes that very word and he uses it in his counsel to the church at Laodicea. So let's move on to the promise. Now these are words that I'm sure most of you are familiar with. I'm sure this verse has been quoted many, many times, typically by some evangelist at an altar call. Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart, and if you hear his voice and open the door, he will come in and eat with you. And so let's just read the promise. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So, behold, I stand at the door and knock. How many of you have heard that That verse. I'm sure most of us, many of us probably just didn't know where it came from, but it actually comes from Revelation. Now, a couple of weeks ago on our Alpha course, those of you who attend our Alpha course will know that there was a reference to the painting of the scene in St. Paul's Cathedral called The Light of the World by William Holman Hunt back in the late 19th century, representing the figure of Jesus preparing to knock on an overgrown and uh, a long-closed door. The light of the world. It's an allegorical painting by the English artist, Holman Hunt. And it shows Jesus standing at the door, but it also has a very interesting a detail that Jesus is not facing the door, he's slightly turned away from the door, almost as if he's about to leave. In other words, he's knocked the last time. The other thing that's noticeable in the painting is that there is no door handle on the outside. And someone told Holman Hunt, you've forgotten the handle. And he replied, no, I haven't. It's on the inside. In other words, we need to open the door to allow Jesus in. He will never force his way in. All he does is he knocks. Now, that interpretation that has generally been accepted by most Christians I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think one can interpret it like that, that Jesus is standing at the door of your heart and knocking. Uh, I don't think there's anything really wrong with it, but I doubt that Jesus had this in mind when he said these words. First of all, who's speaking? Well, it's Jesus clearly who's speaking here. What is the door? Well, For sure, it's not your heart, okay? Remember that Jesus is speaking to a church here. And so the door represents the door of the church. Metaphorically speaking, Jesus says, I will come into your church. This is a church that Christ is not in. In the church at Sardis, he was there 
in the presence of those who had not soiled their garments, you'll remember. Those who were true believers. But it appears that in this church, where everyone is so self-sufficient and complacent, he's not in this church. He's on the outside. He's on the outside knocking on the church door, asking to enter. It really reminds me, I think I'm not quite sure whether it was William Booth or the Salvation Army, but someone once said, it could have been Leonard Ravenhill, one of the two of them said that if the Holy Spirit had to leave the church, many churches would not have even, even realize it. If the Holy Spirit had to leave and be outside the church, many churches would just carry on without even realizing that he'd left. That's always struck a chord in my heart. And when I think of this church, this is exactly what we see. Jesus standing on the outside of the church. And friends, it is so easy for us to gather within these four walls to go through all our religious ceremonies and we leave Jesus outside. Now, we know that Jesus is everywhere, and so, you know, strictly speaking, biblically, that cannot be. But in terms of the analogy, figuratively, Jesus is outside because we have not allowed Jesus into our lives, into our hearts, which is why the door is so often used to symbolize our heart. This is a very, very strong word that Jesus gives, a promise. And he gives a final promise. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my, my throne, and I will also overcome, as I also overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. Now Christ was promised a throne. You, you'll remember that. We mentioned that last week. Uh, Gabriel told Mary that he would sit on the throne of David, that was David's throne. He's no longer on David's throne today. Jesus is sitting on his father's throne. And I want to give a heads up for next week, because next week we move into chapter 4, an absolutely incredible chapter, chapter 4 and 5, because what we're going to be doing is, with John, we're going to literally be transported into the throne room of God. Now, this is not a, just a vision looking at the throne group, room. John literally, in, in some mysterious way, is literally transported into the throne room of God. And what we have described in chapter 4 and 5 is what is happening in that throne room where we talk about the 4 and 20 elders and so on. And we'll come back to that next week. And I'll give you some homework to do before we get to next week. So... Just listen carefully to that. Okay, so there's the promise. To him who overcomes, I will grant access or grant to sit with me on my throne. That is God's promise to everyone who overcomes. The exhortation, as we've seen every week, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. How many of you have ears? Don't answer that. Okay, so let's close with the with a, something I want to put up. I found it quite, uh, yeah, quite sobering. Uh, it's a reference that Chuck Missler makes to an inscription in the entrance portal of a church in Germany, which is quite surprising, really. So it's this inscription in the entrance portal of a church in Germany that really sums up the church of Laodicea. And let me put it up for you. This is what they have inscribed in the church portal. You call me master and obey me not. You call me light and see me not. You call me way and walk me not. You call me life and choose me not. You call me wise and follow me not. You call me fair and love me not. 
You call me rich and ask me not. You call me eternal and seek me not. You call me noble and serve me not. You call me gracious and trust me not. You call me might and honor me not. You call me just and fear me not. So if I condemn you, blame me not. Here was a church who thought they were rich and had need of nothing. And yet Jesus' verdict is that they are lukewarm and he'll spew them out of his mouth. If ever words captured this church, it's these words. But sadly, these words capture too many of our churches today. And once again, friends, let's not look beyond our own boundaries. Let's look at ourselves. Are we guilty of any of these things? Are we as individuals guilty of these things? And so on that note, we're going to close out these seven letters. And for next week, I'd like you to read chapters four and five as you are taken into the throne room of the universe. Now, she has a kind of surprising reading that I want you to do. I want you to read those four short chapters of the book of Ruth. The four chapters of the book of Ruth in the Old Testament. You will not understand chapter 5 until you have read the book of Ruth. And you'll see why when we get there. So go and read Ruth and read chapter 4 and 5. And and obviously, come back next week. Otherwise... (laughs) Otherwise, you're not going to know. Otherwise, it's kind of pointless, you know. Okay. So, let's close in a word of prayer, shall we? Lord, we just have been so taken by these letters to your church. And... It is made with such sobering reading and application to our own lives, to our own church. And Lord, we we come to you as your people this morning and confess our failures, confess our waywardness, confess the coldness of our hearts, Confess, Lord, where we have honored your doctrines but lacked in our devotion. Where we have not been willing to be persecuted for your namesake. Where we have not stood up for the gospel. Where we have married the world and become one with the world. So that when we are out there in the workplace, there's no difference between us and those in the world. Forgive us, Lord, for that spirit of Jezebel that is within so many of us. A spirit of rebellion, of manipulation and domination and intimidation. Where it's our way or no way. Forgive us, Lord, when we have thought that we were alive but are in fact dead. Forgive us when we have failed to be the missionary church that you have called us to be. When we have not gone out according to your great commission and the authority given to us and proclaimed the gospel to every nation. 
And forgive us, Lord, when we have considered ourselves to be rich and in need of nothing. When in actual fact we are wretched, poor, pitiful, and blind. Lord, we just ask that you would forgive us as a church where we have failed you, where we have not been the light of the world that you call us to be. Search our own hearts, Lord, each one of us. And may we not be lukewarm, but may we be on fire for you, And go out and proclaim your good news to all around us. And so we thank you, Lord, for your word. And as we move from what is to what is to come, open our hearts, Lord, to catch a glimpse of your amazing glory as it is revealed in these subsequent chapters. Help us to be diligent in studying your word. And in doing so, may we receive that special blessing that you promise to all who read this book. And we ask this in and through that name that is above every other name, the name of the one who is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray.